So before we get into this presentation, let's establish a little baseline of what you think right now about food and agriculture. So if you could all text agriculture I-485 to number 37607, you'll be set up on poll everywhere and you can answer a few questions. So first question. Oh, uh, sorry, did everyone get a chance to text that? I thought that was going to show at the top of the screen. Uh, no, I don't think it did. Okay, just give everyone a couple more seconds then. Great, thank you. I hope this works. <laughs> okay, so what comes sorry. to mind when you think about food and agriculture? And while you're doing I that... What I might do. Sorry about that. Would you mind going back to that screen again and I'll post it in the chat? That would be great. I'm, I think I might have had to turn something on and pull everywhere. Sorry, this is my second time using it. Um, so. Got it. That's what we're going to text. And we're going to text the agriculture 1485 to the number 3701. Is that correct? Agriculture 1485. No, it's sorry, it's, it's I-485. Okay, glad I checked. Agriculture I-4-1. No, 4 eight, five. So that's, we're gonna text agriculture I-485 to the number 37607. Natasha, I just realized why this isn't working. Sorry, I had to, um... I had to get a new computer yesterday and I didn't download uh -huh. the widget. Okay. So, okay, so the poll is not gonna work. So um, I apologize for that. Can we uh, maybe just try it in the chat box? Sure, we'll just, we'll just do the first one. Just, uh, just let me know a couple of things that come to mind when you think about food and agriculture. And you'll have to read them to me, Natasha, because I can't see the... No problem. So oh, Megan's saying accessibility, farms, ecology, food security and sovereignty, sustainability, food insecurity, food deserts, permaculture, soil, GMOs, urban gardening, pesticides, erosion, getting some great feedback here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, everyone. I apologize for this. I'm sorry. I, uh, yeah, my computer wasn't no working. I grabbed a spare out of the office and I totally forgot that I had to download that thing to make this work. So I'll just, uh, instead of, since you can't answer the questions, I'll just give you some statistics. Um, at the Department of Agriculture, we're a member of the Canadian Center for Food Integrity, and they do annual research on uh, what Canadians think about food and agriculture. So uh, I was gonna compare your results Sorry, Rebecca, I think we've lost audio. Oh, shoot. Oh, no, now you're back. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, so, uh, I, I don't know where you last heard. Um, the Canadian Centre for Food Integrity is a national nonprofit that does research on what Canadians think about food and agriculture. So, uh, in 2019, their research found that 60% of Canadians have a positive impression of Canadian agriculture, 26% have a neutral opinion, 6% have a negative opinion, and 7% say they don't know enough to form an opinion. Um, in 2019, they also found that 35% of respondents feel that the food system is moving in the right direction, 24% feel that it's off on the wrong track, and 42% are unsure. And 57% uh, of Canadians, oh, that's incorrect, sorry. Uh, it's 90% of Canadians know very little or nothing about agriculture. Um, so you can see that reflected in what, how people think about is the food system moving in the right direction they really uh, you know where 42 percent said they were unsure um, there's really an issue with canadians not knowing a lot about what goes on on farms 
Um, but the Canadian Centre for Food Integrity's research consistently finds that of a range of life concerns, including things like healthcare and energy and climate change, Canadians' number one concern consistently year over year is keeping healthy food affordable. So we know that food is, is something that's top of mind for Canadians, uh, food prices um, and, and healthy food. So over the course of this presentation, I'm going to convince you that agriculture is one of the most important things you can teach your students, one of the most important career fields that you can encourage them to pursue, and one of the most important things that you personally should care about. I'm also going to introduce you to a number of curriculum-linked, experiential, and inquiry-based resources that Agriculture in the Classroom Nova Scotia makes available to teachers for free to support your classroom work and to spread the important message that the future of our food depends on the contributions of your students. Um, this slide has a quote from the author and journalist Michael Pollan, who says that the way we eat represents our most profound engagement with the natural world. Daily, our eating turns nature into culture, transforming the body of the world into our bodies and minds. Agriculture isn't top of mind for most students when they're considering their future. It just may never occur to them, or they may have formed negative impressions of the industry due to outdated stereotypes or sensational headlines. We're trying to change that. Let's watch a short video that shows the exciting opportunities available. <laughs> it's time, they say. Make a plan, they say. But when it comes to your future, you want a career that fits you. The right career is more than a job. It's a lifestyle. It's always growing, always changing. Your place is where high tech meets old school, where you can make a difference and cultivate a life, literally. Agriculture has it all. The opportunities are endless. Yeah, it's farming and it's so much more. Agriculture is where science, engineering, business, and the environment meet to feed our planet. Shakira chose agriculture. Let's see what she's been up to. Agriculture to me is everything from the farm right to your plate. It's the soil, the plants, the production, the business, the transportation, and everything in between. In the government, there are lots of options for agriculture. There's me as a program coordinator. We also have lawyers, veterinarians, extension workers that work directly on farms. I would say if you want to pursue a career in agriculture, don't worry about if you have the prior knowledge or think that you're able to do it because there's really room for everyone in the industry from the most simple to complex jobs. For every agriculture graduate in Canada, there are four jobs waiting in the industry. And one out of every eight jobs in the country depend on the industry. Now that's an exciting field. David chose agriculture and he's been putting some cool tech to good use. I think a lot of people see farming as people out and milking cows by hand and sprinkling grain to chickens. And I think one of the biggest misconceptions is the amount of innovation that's happened in this industry. You know, in the past 60 years, farmers are able to produce like four times the amount of produce from the same amount of inputs. We've been able to increase milk production. We have the robotic milkers, all the chicken barns now, all the ventilation and fan and temperature controls are all on computers. Some of our equipment, like our cedars and combines, all the information that they're generating is projected onto our iPad. I think the next generations of farmers coming up and their ability to just pick up technology and run with it, I think is really gonna help farming really innovate and move forward. It's a great industry to be involved in. A career in agriculture is waiting for you. Choose a future that will change the future in an industry that keeps on growing. Choose a career in agriculture. A message from the government of Nova Scotia. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right. The movie Interstellar, which is set in the year 2067, is a cautionary tale of what can happen if we don't take food production seriously. In this scene, the school is streaming a student into agriculture and his father wants him to take engineering instead. Interestingly, we need farmers and engineers to grow food. More on that later in the presentation. If we don't want to run out of food, the old stereotypes of farming need to go the way of the one room schoolhouse. In 1900, each farmer produced enough food for 10 people and Canadians spent 50 cents of every dollar they earned on food. Today, each farmer produces enough food for around 120 people and Canadians only spend around 10 cents of every dollar earned on food. Modern farming is efficient and productive. It's still hard work, and like any business, the returns can be variable and dependent on a lot of factors outside of a farmer's control. But it's also interesting and rewarding work. Agriculture is a managed ecosystem, agroecology. And as the former president of the Ecological Society of America famously said, ecology isn't rocket science, it's much more difficult. When I talk about agriculture, what am I talking about? I like this definition from a former professor of mine at the Nova Scotia Agricultural College. Agriculture is the science, art, politics, and sociology of changing sunlight, soil, and water into happy, healthy people. This definition is succinct but broad, simply phrased but incredibly complex. Happy, healthy people are people who are eating the full range of nutrients in just the right quantities, not too little, not too much. They also need to live in an environment with healthy soil and clean, abundant water. Creating that agroecology is the science and art of agriculture. What do politics and sociology have to do with agriculture, you may wonder? Well, a current example is China's ban on Canadian canola imports. 40% of Canadian canola used to be sold to China. The ban is ostensibly due to pest contamination, but it coincided with Canada's arrest of Meng Wanzhou and is widely believed to be a retaliatory measure. At a municipal level, the politics of land zoning can have a significant impact on farms. And sociology, well, that has a lot to do with what people choose to eat, where they choose to buy it, and in what format. The COVID pandemic has provided us with some stark examples of this. Demand for potatoes plummeted as French fry sales dried up in the early months of the pandemic. Meanwhile, flour shortages were real and common. Home baking experienced a renaissance and pizzas were also in high demand. While the impact of the pandemic on consumer food choices was completely unpredictable, every year farmers must decide what to grow based on what they think will sell at a price that turns a profit for them. When I talk about agriculture, I'm also talking about aquaculture. Oceans serve as the world's largest source of protein. Farming fish is fairly new, developed commercially only around the 1970s, but it now accounts for nearly 50% of the world's food fish and is one of the fastest growing food producing sectors. Aquaculture includes fish farmed in sea pens or land-based tanks or ponds, shellfish production, and seaweed production. We're now going to go over some statistics, which I'll summarize in advance. We have a huge challenge ahead of us as our entire food system is under pressure but we also have a huge opportunity to create positive changes. We have enough food right now. We have so much food that we regularly throw a third of it away. Uh, in spite of this abundance of food, 820 million people regularly go to bed hungry. And this was statistics from before the COVID pandemic. Our global population is also projected to increase by 2 billion by 2050, only 30 years away. And climate change is going to impact production. For each one degree Celsius of warming, grain yields decline by about 5%. Why this is, why some are hungry and some eat too much, has to do with the politics and sociology of food that I referred to. Sticking with the science, unless we increase food production, we will not have enough food for everyone 30 years from now. I want to talk a little bit about agriculture's contribution to climate change. There are groups that claim the single most effective individual action you can take to mitigate climate change is to go vegan, or at least to give up beef. I've seen headlines claiming that agriculture contributes to as much as half of all greenhouse gas emissions. Well, the 2014 UN climate change statistics list agriculture, forestry, and other land use as contributing 24% of direct greenhouse gas emissions, which is a lot, and just slightly lower than electricity and heat production. 
But when we look at the breakdown of this 24%, we can see that half of that comes from deforestation and peat bogs, which are the dark red and orange bars at the bottom of this graph, and which have fluctuated the most since the 1970s. So that leaves agriculture with about 12%. Of that 12%, the largest amount comes from enteric fermentation, the large yellow bar, which in layman's terms is methane produced by cattle, sheep, and other ruminants. And the second highest amount is nitrous oxide emissions from manure on pastures, the light blue bar. Methane and nitrous oxide are potent greenhouse gases with significantly more warming potential than carbon. So cattle are definitely contributing to climate change, but I think not quite as much as some headlines are leaning, leading people to believe. The other thing about agriculture in general is that when plants grow, they capture carbon. When the plants are harvested, the carbon is released, but with good management practices, some of that carbon will be stored in the soil and an increase in perennial crops like fruit trees and bushes, but also permanent pastures will increase carbon capture. And cattle can contribute to that carbon capture. Cattle and other ruminants are capable of converting grass, which humans can't digest, into meat, which is a high quality, nutritionally dense protein that we can digest. There is a lot of land in the world that is not suitable for annual cropping for a number of reasons. A fragile structure making it prone to erosion, low fertility, or lack of rainfall. But it is suitable for grazing. With good grazing management, that marginal land can be protected and restored, capturing carbon and providing food from land that would otherwise yield none. This is not to negate the methane and nitrous oxide emissions that cattle produce, but there is research underway around things like feed additives to reduce methane emissions. In fact, preliminary research has found that small amounts of seaweed added to cattle feed can reduce methane emissions by up to 99%. This bottom photo shows uh, a cow at the Dalhousie Faculty of Agriculture that has a cannula inserted in her stomach so that researchers can insert food directly into the rumen and pull it out to monitor digestion. At the Canadian level, how well are we converting sunlight, soil, and water into happy, healthy people? Well, we are trying to help feed the world. Agriculture is big business in Canada, especially on the prairies where most of our major ex export crops like wheat, canola, and lentils are produced. Agriculture contributes to 6.7% of our GDP and employs 12.5% of Canadians. But the sector's growth and even stability is threatened by labor shortages that already exist and are projected to get worse. These labor shortages exist at all levels, from PhD level researchers to field workers and everywhere in between. Meanwhile, on the climate change front, agriculture contributes to about 10% of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions, slightly better than the global 12%, but there is still room for improvement there, and in fact, improvements are already taking place. For example, a 2011 study found that Canadian beef Use, produces 15% less greenhouse gas emissions, uses 17% less water and 24% less land than in 1981. In 2016, a study found that Canadian dairy farmers produced 15% more milk while reducing the sector's carbon footprint by 7%, water usage by 6%, and land use by 11% since 2011. But more importantly, there is a need for adaptation. Canadian farmers are not as vulnerable to some of the worst effects of climate change that are expected to affect countries nearer the equator. And there was a time when some experts thought that climate change would be good for Canada's farmers by extending our season. But as the effects of climate change on our weather patterns become more pronounced, it's becoming clear that there are no winners in this game. We are seeing more extreme weather events across the country, as well as an increase in stalled weather. Our climate used to be marked by a few days of sun alternating with a few days of rain, but now it's more like a few weeks of sun and then a few weeks of rain. In the past few years, many parts of the country have seen unusually wet springs, which delays planting, followed by bone dry summers, followed by unusually wet falls hampering harvest. Farming under those weather patterns is challenging to say the least. At the provincial level, how are we doing? Well, our agriculture sector is small, but it's the backbone of our rural economy with revenues of over half a million dollars, half a billion dollars. Aquaculture contributes another $88.6 million to our rural economy. Our largest land-based sector economically is dairy. By number of farms, it's beef, and by export value, it's wild blueberries, our provincial berry. From a climate change perspective, agriculture only contributes to 2.62% of Nova Scotia's greenhouse gas emissions. 
The good news here is that the agriculture sector does not have far to go to be carbon negative. Agriculture has a great deal of potential to be a carbon sink and to store more carbon than it emits, offsetting emissions from other sectors. Nova Scotia has already reduced its greenhouse gas emissions to below 2005 levels and has now set a goal of being net zero by 2050. Our good work as a province has allowed us to avoid a carbon tax since we have achieved significant reductions without it. We are already seeing some opportunities from a warmer climate as well. Our, uh, our growing wine grape industry has been possible because of our warming climate. Farmers are also able to grow varieties of certain crops that they weren't able to in the past. But the challenges are there as well. Post-tropical storm Arthur in 2014, the every Wednesday snowstorm that didn't melt until May, winter of 2015, the late spring frost in 2018, Hurricane Dorian in 2019. These events are just the beginning of what climate change has in store for us and farmers are getting ready to adapt. I'd also like to make the point that while we may not have a lot of farms, most Nova Scotians love them. Our buy local movement is one of the strongest in the country. We have the most farmers markets per capita in Canada and people are actively looking for local products on store shelves because Nova Scotians understand the importance of supporting businesses in our communities and buying food close to home. By the way, if you are one of the Nova Scotians making an effort to buy local, Taste of Nova Scotia has a campaign to help you better identify local foods in grocery stores. Watch for get your hands on local signage throughout the stores. So I'll pause here and ask Natasha, are there any questions that have come up so far? Nope, no questions so far. All right. Well, that was a snapshot of where agriculture is currently. And now I'll talk about where the industry is headed. So globally, we need to produce a greater volume of food to feed the extra two to three billion people we're expecting to share our planet with. And for everyone to be happy and healthy, that increase in food production can't just be more calories. We need more nutrition, high quality protein and more fruits and vegetables. With up to 30% of food currently grown being wasted, reducing food loss and waste is a pretty obvious place to start. Food waste happens at every stage in the food system. Crops can be rendered inedible by insects and disease, plant diseases at the farm, or they can be rejected by retailers because they don't meet grade standards for appearance. Some food is lost on the way from the farm to the retailer. This is more of an issue in countries that lack adequate refrigeration than in Canada. And then once in the store, more food is lost if it begins to rot or passes its expiry date before it's sold. Finally, food is wasted at home. Research conducted by the National Zero Waste Council in 2017 found that the average Canadian household throws away 140 kilograms of food per year, and 63% of that waste could have been eaten. Allocating our food resources better at every level of the food chain to reduce waste means we can feed more people. Rotting food releases methane, so reducing food waste also reduces greenhouse gas emissions. But reducing waste alone won't give us the increased supply we need, and we also need to grow it in a way that reduces negative environmental impacts and enhances positive environmental impacts. Most of the knowledge and technology that we need to do this already exists. Some of the required changes are simple, like crop rotation, cover cropping, and rotational grazing. These need to be optimized or more widely practiced. Others are more complex, and the research and technology required are here or are about to come online. Things like enhancing soil biology to improve soil carbon storage or reducing greenhouse gas emissions and waterway pollution caused by fertilizer by using GPS equipped farm machinery to enable precision application. Research and technology are going to provide us with the solutions we need to solve other problems. One of the most critical areas for research is in the development of new crop varieties. Some really interesting global initiatives are attempting things like turning wheat from an annual crop into a perennial one, or inserting the C4 photosynthetic pathway, which is more efficient in hot, humid, higher carbon dioxide environments into species that currently use C3 photosynthesis. Some of the new crop variety development will be done using next generation genetic engineering, precise gene editing and silencing techniques made possible by CRISPR technology. Automation is one of the other places where technology is making huge advances and it can make things better for everyone. Farm worker health and safety, food safety and animal welfare. Technologies that even a decade ago seemed impossible like robotic weeders and fruit harvesters are now on the cusp of commercialization. 
The picture shows a robotic weeder developed in Nova Scotia by a startup called Nexus Robotics. Along with automation comes data and the capacity for better decision making. Data collected by robotic milkers can detect an infection in a dairy cow before she shows any symptoms. GPS-equipped steering mechanisms on tractors allow farmers to precisely cover every inch of a field with no overlap. Over thousands of acres, even a few inches of overlap can add up to increased hours of labor, fuel, seed, fertilizer, and pesticide. There are real cost savings here. GPS-equipped tractors can measure yield as it comes off the field and mark the location so farmers can pinpoint issues with fertility, soil compaction, and weeds. Sea farming is also going to play an increasingly important role in food production. Demand for fish is increasing worldwide, even as pressure continues on many of our commercial wild fish stocks. Aquaculture already accounts for over 50% of the fish destined for human consumption. As with land-based agriculture, aquaculture will need to continue to increase production while minimizing its environmental impact. A great deal of research is happening on this front as well, including feed efficiency, containment technology, and new genetics. What does this mean for you and your students? I hope as I've been talking, you've been seeing the possibilities. Our agriculture and food industry is doing its part here in Nova Scotia to turn sunlight, soil, and water into happy, healthy people. But we can't do it alone. We need more people in this field. We need farmers, entrepreneurs who can adapt to the future, grow more food, and make money doing it. But we also need coders, engineers, researchers, and regulators. We need business analysts, international trade specialists, marketers, and logistics specialists. We need forklift operators and fish plant workers and livestock technicians too. There is a place in agriculture for everyone to do work they love. We need the cerebral kids to do the research, the entrepreneurial kids who can seize opportunities, the creative kids to design new technologies or food products, and the practical kids who want to work in the barns, fields, tractors, boats, and factories to take up this challenge of feeding the world while saving the environment. And we need you as educators to tell them about it. So that's a short intro to some of the challenges facing our, food, our future food supply. And you may feel a little daunted at the prospect of effectively teaching that to your students. That's okay, we can help. Agriculture in the Classroom Nova Scotia has information on agricultural careers, off-site programs, and classroom learning experiences that meet curriculum outcomes at all grade levels. And we are continually expanding this suite of resources. Let us know how we can help you prepare your students to meet one of the defining challenges of our time. Through our membership in Agriculture in the Classroom Canada, we have access to SNAPAG, a collection of information sheets on agricultural topics such as organic agriculture, GMOs, pesticides, fertilizer, hormones, antibiotics, animal welfare, and environmental stewardship. We also participate in a national program called GenAg. Last year, we piloted this program with two developing opportunities classes. The students learned about agricultural careers and marketing and then implemented a plan to market agricultural careers to their peers. This year, the program will be available to developing opportunities classes and any other grade nine teacher that is interested in applying. AgZone is an experiential offsite learning experience for grade seven. We partner with universities to arrange a series of stations that students visit in groups of 15 to 20 to learn about agricultural research, technology, and careers. We're exploring moving this to a virtual format uh, since we've the back to school plan has been released. Grow Where You're Planted is similar to AgZone, but will provide a more in-depth experience at the Dalhousie Agricultural Campus for African Nova Scotian students in grades 10 to 11 from across the province. This was originally scheduled in May 2020, but has been postponed until May 2021. The Quest for the Perfect Strawberry is a resource for grade nine science students learning about plant reproduction. Classrooms will receive a hydroponic growing kit along with strawberry seeds and bare root plants so students can compare sexual and asexual reproduction. Teachers will also have access to two short videos that showcase a commercial strawberry farm that grows berries hydroponically, strawberry nursery, and the Canadian Strawberry Breeding Program, which is located in Kenfell. Journey 2050 is an online game that allows students to make decisions about food production and environmental sustainability on farms in three different countries. The impact of their decisions plays out virtually over a span of three decades. 
This game is played over four classroom sessions. It is available to students for free and Department of Agriculture staff can facilitate the first session. We also have several resources in development this year. One is an investigation into animal agriculture for high school students, looking at different sides of whether farming animals is good for the environment, good for animals, and good for humans. We're working on a resource for grade seven students that highlights wild blueberry production and its historical and current relationship with the Mi'kmaq people. We're updating some soil resources for grade seven and eight students, focusing on different aspects of soil health. And we're just getting started on a resource for, on food security for grade nine citizenship. I'd also like to let you know about some financial support that your grade 12 students may be interested in exploring. The G3 Grow Beyond Scholarship is a partnership between G3, a prairie-based agricultural logistics firm, and Agriculture in the Classroom Canada. Six students this year received a $4,000 scholarship and their schools also received $1,000 for their short videos describing their vision for the future of agriculture. Students do not need to be enrolled in an agriculture program to apply. The Department of Agriculture provides a bursary to students enrolled in a post-secondary program who work on registered Nova Scotia farms. Students who work 250 hours during the growing season can receive a $500 bursary, and students who work 500 hours can receive a $1,000 bursary. This bursary is in addition to their wages. I hope you now feel inspired to learn more about agriculture and aquaculture and to pass that inspiration on to your students. If you would like to participate in one of our programs or access one of our resources, please leave your email address in the chat and we will be in touch. Are there any questions? Uh, yes, we did have some questions. Um, let's go back. So um, first off, uh, Megan was asking, is the government doing anything to protect farmable land from development? Uh, so the provincial government has a provincial statement of interest on agricultural land. So uh, if a municipality is um, changing zoning, uh, the Department of Agriculture may um, present an opinion. Uh, beyond that, it's up to municipalities um, to protect it with zoning. So that has happened in Kings County and in East Hants. So um, just for some context, uh, Nova Scotia is interesting in certain parts of the province and particularly Kings County and East Hants, which is why they have those zones. Um, there is a lot of competition for agricultural land, uh, but then in other parts of the province, um, like most of Cape Breton, a lot of Cumberland County, a lot of Annapolis County, most of the South Shore, like there's lots of agricultural land growing up in trees because no one wants it for anything. So it's, uh, it's hard to have a provincial policy when things are so different from county to county. Exactly. Heidi brought up the fact that there is a real problem with development on farmland in the Annapolis Valley in particular. Mm -hmm. um, Megan had another question. Are there programs for food recovery from unsold or marginal foods being diverted from waste to food banks? Um, so I, I can't speak to that. Um, Broadly, uh, it's outside of my area of expertise, but there is a tax credit available for farmers who donate unsold uh, produce to food banks. Um, so that has helped increase donations. Uh, from the farmer's point of view, I've, uh, I'm not um, saying this to you specifically, Megan, but I've seen criticism in comment sections on news articles. Um, farmers, you know, it costs them money to harvest. They have to pay to harvest it. So the the tax credit helps offset some of the additional costs that they would incur um, because they didn't just leave it in the field. Great, thanks. Um, and please put a comment in the chat if you have a follow-up question uh, related to any questions that I brought to Rebecca. Thanks. Um, Heidi has a question now. Are there problems to include, excuse me, are there programs to include more agriculturally based programs in schools? I know you did um, highlight that in your presentation, but uh, Heidi, did you have any follow-up questions for that? And if you think of one, please feel free to just pop it in the chat while we get to Megan's next question, which was, does the government have any role in controlling the portion of the food price that is manipulated by distributors like Loblaws, which is the biggest influencer on food affordability? 
Um, so we have in Canada, you may have heard of um, supply management. So supply management is uh, something that is regulated by industry, but it's enabled through government legislation. And with supply management, the sectors that participate can set the price at all levels of the food chain. So they set the price at the, you know what the farmer gets paid, what the processor gets paid, and what the retailer is allowed to charge. So we have supply management for milk, uh, chicken eggs, chicken meat, and turkey meat. Um, so those prices are fairly regulated, um, but they're the only commodities or sectors that, that participate in the supply management program. So for anything else, beef, pork, uh, lamb, um, all of the fresh produce, uh, the, the price is basically set by the marketplace. So um, the retailers will pay the farmers what they think that, you know, based on what they think they can sell it for and what demand there will be. Uh, some farmers will have contracts with a guaranteed price to some of the retailers or processors, um, but really the price is, is based on the market um, and the government doesn't play a role in interfering with that. And the government doesn't set, uh, isn't involved in setting the price for the supply managed products either, but they have developed the legislation that um, enables uh, enables the, the different players to set the price. Uh, Heidi was also wondering about uh, salaries of farmers. Yeah, so um, so farming is a business. Um, so uh, as the farmer, the business owner, how much you earn depends on how efficient you are at, at, at producing your products and how good you are at marketing them. So if you're in a supply managed sector, then uh, the price of your product is set so you can earn more money if you can produce it more efficiently and at a lower cost. Uh, if you're not in a supply managed sector, uh, then it's about, uh, again, efficiency and volume, um, or it could be about uh, creating a niche product that commands a higher price, uh, it's higher value, and then um, increasing your sales. So, uh, you know, new farmers who are starting out tend to not be very efficient or have very large markets, just like any small business that's starting out. So they tend to be less profitable, but uh, as they um, become more efficient and expand their, their markets, then there are opportunities to uh to make more money. Um, so I talked a little bit in my presentation about some of the uh, actors outside of farmers control. So I, I have a, a very small farm part-time and what I've learned and, and talking to other farmers, this is their experience too. How productive you are, um, like how much you can produce from your land, around 30% of that either way just depends on the weather. So you can modify that with, uh, you know, putting things under cover in a greenhouse or having irrigation for a dry year, having really good drainage for a wet year. But even with all of those things, there's still a pretty wide range. So you can sort of say, you know, I'm going to spend this much money and do this much labor and I think I'll get this much and then sell it for this price and make money. But uh, the amount that you produce can go, you know, 30 percent less than your average or 30 percent more based entirely on the weather. And you don't know from year to year what the weather is going to be. So there's, you know, which you, you, you wouldn't have if you, you've got like a restaurant or a corner store or something. I mean, what, I know weather still can impact whether people go to, out to restaurants and things like that, but I think not as much as, uh, as with a farm. So, um, you know, the, the really good farmers, uh, they take, they're really good at risk management. They take those sorts of things into account, hedge their bets, and, and they can be really efficient and make a really good living. Um, there's, there can be other factors that come into play, like, you know, losing a contract with a retailer or um, uh, shifts in demand, um, like like the toilet paper thing with COVID, right? And then we saw, like I said, the increased demand for flour, decreased demand for potatoes because of French fries. So those sorts of things can still happen uh, at a smaller scale, you know, even when there's not a pandemic that can um, throw, throw a wrench in people's plans. Uh, but yeah, so beyond that, for salaries, farm workers, um, it tends to be a minimum wage job. Um, you, you tend to get a lot of hours if you want them. So you can still make a pretty good living. And then people who move up to a management level would probably be making as much as um, 50 or 60,000 a year, maybe even more, depending on the, the level of responsibility in the operation. Uh, and then there's careers across the entire value chain. So um, Excuse me. At the Dalhousie Faculty of Agriculture, there's lots of tenure track professor positions that are, you know, six-figure salaries. 
Um, there's entrepreneurs in the food processing sector that could be running multi-million dollar businesses. So there's, um, if, if salary is what's motivating your students, there are, there are opportunities to make large amounts of money in the agriculture industry. Great, thanks. Um, are there any programs that will encourage things like permaculture or operating greenhouses, vertical gardening, etc.? So, um, hmm. sorry, can you just repeat that one more time? I missed the middle thing. Permaculture, oh. vertical gardening, and and uh, uh, permaculture, operating greenhouses, and vertical gardening. Right. So I, I, I'm not sure if you're talking about for farmers or for um, students. Um, for students, we we have some uh, class. Okay, for students. So we have uh, some classroom growing kits. Um, mostly we target those at the elementary level. Those succeed hydroponic kits for grade nine is something new that we're piloting this year. So we'll see how that goes. Um, in terms of having like a school greenhouse or a school garden. We had a school garden grant program several years ago. And as I'm sure you can all imagine, the issue with having an outdoor school garden is who looks after it in July and August when nobody's around uh, at the school. Um, in terms of a greenhouse, um, yeah, if, if I had that much money, um, I would love to have a greenhouse in every school. Uh, but right now we, we don't have the funds. So if there was a school that had their own funding to set up a greenhouse, we could absolutely provide support for that, but uh, I don't have enough of a budget to provide funds to help schools set up a greenhouse. Um, so yeah, we don't have a specialized program because there's not that many schools that have them as far as I know. Um, as for permaculture, so um, I am an organic farmer. Uh, I know a little bit about permaculture. Um, it's, it's huh. Can permaculture feed the world? That's like an hours long discussion. There's lots of things I really like about permaculture. Um, it's a big shift in mindset for most of our farms and it would be difficult to put into practice um, on a lot of Canadian farms. So it's not something that we're actively teaching about. Um, it's, it's still kind of a niche thing in the agriculture industry that uh, I haven't seen practiced on a large scale. Uh, yeah, students, sorry, just responding to Heidi's follow-up comment to teach students how to grow their own food. Sure, but permaculture is an outdoor thing. So again, it's it's the uh, who looks after it in July and August when the school's closed. Uh, Mary was asking, um, what is the health of soil in Nova Scotia? Hmm. So I'm, I'm working on a project right now with some other people in the Department of Agriculture that's trying to establish a better baseline on that. Um, Nova Scotia soils in general are not uh, inherently super healthy. So there's, I guess we look from soil health at the physical, the chemical and the biological characteristics. So from a chemical characteristic, most soils in Nova Scotia are pretty acidic. Um, that's great for growing things like wild blueberries and spruce forests, but it's not so great for growing most of our other agricultural crops. So we require the addition of limestone for our soils to be productive, and that has to be re renewed every um, few years. So um, from a chemical standpoint, not super healthy, not super high levels of or organic, you know, background levels of organic matter or um, uh, natural fertility. So uh, that makes it a challenge. It means farmers are uh, continually having to add limestone, having to add um, fertility in different forms and having to add and protect their organic matter. Um, we do have some baseline data that, uh, that shows that erosion is an issue that needs to be um, addressed, uh, not, um, uh, I don't know how to put this into context. Um, I, I did some analysis of our environmental farm plan data and erosion was the second highest problem, but much, much lower than the highest problem. So it's not like it's a massive problem, but it is something that um, that needs to be worked on. Um, in terms of soil biology, uh, I, I think there's a lot of room for improvement, but we don't, that, that's part of the project that I'm, I'm participating in. Um, we don't have a really good baseline of, of uh, sort of what, yeah, the, the standard that we would measure against to know if we're improving, e even what our standard is, like the whole, the soil health, soil biology field is fairly new. So um, 
yeah, there's research happening at the Dalhousie Faculty of Agriculture and in other places looking at how do we measure soil biology? How do we know what's healthy, what isn't? How do we create a benchmark? So um, I know I'm kind of skirting around the question uh, and I'm really, I don't have hard data to say whether the soil is healthy or not, but it's, um, it's something that's being looked at. And I, I would say generally uh, there's, there's lots of room for improvement, but there's lots of good things that are happening too. Um, Mary also asks, how close are we as a province at being self-sufficient in terms of feeding our population? Oh, not very close. Um, we're at like uh, 20 or 25 percent. So, uh, yeah, if if um, if they say if the isthmus of Shiknecto was uh, damaged in a, a storm, we have like a three day food supply and then we're out of food. So. That's sobering. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Megan, you had had a question uh, earlier. Uh, what about grocery stores? I'm trying to go back and figure out what that was, might have been connected to. I think that maybe was around food waste. Oh, and yeah, again, great. Thank you. Yeah, so um, that's not something that the Department of Agriculture manages. Um, but I, I know anecdotally that there that grocery stores donate to food banks and to um, soup kitchens and, and places like that. So they are trying to reduce food waste. Uh, it's a, it's an incentive for them because they have to pay to have it discarded. So um, they're happy to give it away to somebody that can use it. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to talk about that too much because it's not really my area of expertise. But uh, um, yeah. Uh, Mary has another question. Will you also be looking at current farming practices to see how to improve our soils? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a lot of things that we know are really good for soil, uh, like crop rotation and cover crops and adding organic, man organic matter in the form of uh, manure or cover crops, um, uh, reducing tillage, uh, keeping the soil covered with either uh, live plants or with mulch. Um, so it's, it's about encouraging farmers to adopt those more. And so, you know, farmers are just like everyone else, you know, why do some people smoke and why do some people eat a lot of junk food and why don't people exercise when we know that those are all good things to do. So, um, you know, we sort of know what some of the good things to do are for soil and some farmers do them and some farmers uh, maybe don't do them as much as they should. So um, it's just part of being human and, uh, uh, not always doing what we know to be the right thing for a variety of reasons. Great, thank you. Those are all the questions that I've seen in the chat. Um, please feel free, if I've skipped a question, I do apologize. Uh, please bring it to our attention, perhaps at this time in the chat, or uh, please feel free to take the mic. Um, Sarah asks, can we access the slide presentation for future use? Um, yeah, so I'm in the process of figuring out how to upload that to the Google Drive because uh, Google is blocked on my government computer. Um, and I also have uh, a PDF handout. Um, and I'm not sure, I guess if you email me, uh, I can send it to you. <laughs> that might be the easiest. So if you email me, um, here's our generic email address and this is where you can also send any uh, questions or requests for resources so ag.education at novascotia.ca so I won't email you the presentation because it's like 90 megabytes um, but that will get uploaded to the SLA drive um, where they're hosting all the presentations and then if you email ag.education at novascotia.ca I'll send you the pdf with a list of all the resources and some web links. Um, and uh, uh, if you have any questions about any of our particular programs um, or you want to apply for something, you can also email that address. Uh, hi, Rebecca. I'm just wondering if um, we might be able to get a copy of this recording 
I know that it's going to be uploaded on the SLA website, but it's probably not going to be there for at least a month or so because uh, the organizers have to go through everything. Is, is there any way to get... I, I attended another presentation and I wanted to be at yours at the same time, so I'm feeling a little um, disappointed that I couldn't listen in, um, but is, is there... Um, any way does anybody know that if I might be able to get it sooner or that's a that um, I the only thing I can think of Michelle is perhaps uh, if you go to the ice session if you look at the schedule at the end of each not the end but to the there's always a session that's entitled ice and the yes. organizers for the conference are there yeah so they might maybe I'll ask Lael mm -hmm, check with yeah. Lael and she would know of a way that that might happen. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Welcome. That's because it would be great to have this information sooner rather than later, especially for anyone who's personally interested, but uh, professionally as well. We're getting um, thank yous. Uh, your email oh. seems to be giving an error. Hmm. Um, I okay. Well, I'll give you my other email and try that one. So I guess we have a few minutes left. So um, I'll just ask if uh, this was the information that you. Oh, sorry, Rebecca, we've lost your audio again. Hmm. Oh, Can you hear it now? No, yeah. that's that's weird. I'm not doing anything. It's just cutting out. Um, yeah, so we're hoping to, to use this presentation again at future teachers conferences. And uh, I'm just wondering if there's information that you were hoping to get out of this presentation that I didn't talk about or some things that weren't relevant that I could cut out. I see Mary asked um, if I could share a little more on my organic farm. So I have um, about a quarter of an acre of organic strawberries and then a little bit of garlic. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I, I sort of stepped back from the strawberries this year because it was just really hard to try and manage the timing of things um, while I'm just doing it part time. Uh, so my parents who are, are farmers and live next door, they, they took over the strawberry harvest for me, which was fantastic. So I could still go out and pick strawberries, but I didn't have to be stressed out about, um, you know, hiring other pickers and managing the sales and things like that. So very small, um, very part-time, very um, not super profitable, but uh, I still like doing it. It's a lot of fun. Tips on growing garlic. Um, I, do you have specific questions? I like to plant in mid-October and uh, the, they'll be ready to harvest really soon. Um, I put on a, a pelleted chicken manure for fertilizer in the fall when I plant and in the spring and I spray some uh, organic fish fertilizer on in the spring a few times. Uh, and then the main thing is just to keep them weeded, which is the challenge. Hi, uh, have you ever tried using hay with your garlic. Last year I tried in the fall when I planted my garlic bulbs, I put a layer of hay and then in the spring I put manure. Um, don't know if I was very successful. It seemed my spot was wet. Would that be a problem? Uh, so garlic doesn't like to be wet. Um, it, it wants enough, you know, enough water, but not, it can't tolerate a lot of dampness. Um, I think it wouldn't grow well and it would get moldy. 
Uh, I haven't put hay on. I do put straw on as a mulch and then I leave it on in the spring and just sort of let it break down and the plants come up through it because it helps with weed control. Um, but I have a, a book on growing garlic that says not to mulch because um, they have disease issues with it. Uh, but they're in Washington state, which is quite a different climate from ours. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure about the hay mulch, but if you're in a wet spot, Mary, you might want to try moving to a spot that's a little bit better drained. Uh, and then Heidi asked if garlic are finicky to grow. So I haven't found it to be particularly finicky, but I've, um, I'm just trying to expand the number of varieties that I'm growing, but I started out with a porcelain variety called Music. And uh, I've heard from lots of people that it's absolutely the best one for our Nova Scotia climate. It's, uh, it's also a really nice tasting variety and it stores pretty well. I, I usually keep mine till April or May and I just have them in a... Didn't know that about um, about garlic, Rebecca. Thank you. The very last thing, what, the last thing that you said about um, growing. Hopefully, there wasn't like a secret in there. Unfortunately, you cut out again. Oh, but that's okay. Uh, but I have found that my garlic has been very finicky as well. Okay. I'm growing it for the first time, and uh, and well, we're realizing all of the mistakes that we've made, and hope to not repeat next year with our planter mm -hmm. garden. <laughs> I haven't found it to be too finicky, but um, I, guess, I guess what I said, maybe a cutout is I, I grow a lot of um, a porcelain variety called Music, which um, everyone I know that is serious about garlic says it's the best thing to grow in Nova Scotia. Well, I definitely have to look that up next year. So I bought my garlic from a friend, um, but uh, you can get it through Vessies and most of the seed catalogs that I've seen have music as a variety for sale. Um, but looking, hmm, the uh, Atlantic Canadian Organic Regional Network, ACORN, they used to be a really good place to, to be able to swap seed and they're um, kind of on reduced staff right now. Um, there's a Facebook group called Farming in the Maritimes. If you advertised on there that you were looking to buy music garlic seed you could probably find some for sale or just do a google search there's there's uh, garlic farms that have websites um, that sell seed and they would all have music everyone grows it <laughs> 